Federal Councillor Joseph Dice. Good evening and uh, a warm welcome to this open forum discussion. The subject today is what future, the future of Europe in the world. It's a very simple subject, as you can see. And uh, the fewer we deal with it, the fewer we, uh, the sooner we shall have, we shall be finished here. But uh, s joking aside, I think we do have to uh, observe a certain discipline and contemplate on two principal areas. I would propose that the relationship between Europe and the new powers of Asia, for example, China and India, uh, because that's a major subject at the WEF, and the other uh, I see it comes to my mind looking at the panelists is what about the relationship between Europe and America? We will be having a panel discussion up here for about 50 minutes, and then we'll turn the floor over to the audience so that you can ask questions and join in the discussion. Now, let me introduce the panelists. Well, you all know Josef Dice. He is the Federal Council of Economy for Swiss Confederation, a member of the WE of uh, uh, WEF, and uh, thank you very much for coming along. Sitting beside him, we have Professor Timothy Garten Ash. Professor Garten Ash is an expert in European studies at Oxford University in Britain. S to his side, we see Urs Schürtli, correspondent of the Neue Zürcher Zeitung in Beijing, and I believe also in Tokyo, and he is uh, a well-known expert. And then on the other side, I'm very happy to welcome Erika Mann. She is a member of the European Parliament and also a member of the SPD in Germany. Finally, Andreas Gross. National Councillor of Switzerland from the Canton of Zürich. Mr. Federal Councillor Josef Dice, I, uh, I took an hour coming here, then I took a walk around, and I saw a poster, a placard, uh, which said in, in so many words, India is the best democracy for global investors. Now, I haven't actually seen a similar placard for uh, Europe or any anything similar for Switzerland. What do you make of that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. I would say that uh, Swiss placards, posters are, are ubiquitous. You could see them everywhere in the world. And if anybody knows anything about Switzerland, it's Davos they know about. Last week I was in India myself, and you can't imagine how proud I was. Uh, how proud they were that there was going to be a special Indian program here with five ministers or perhaps even more and a very uh, numerous delegation from India and they were very proud of that. But turning now to the subject, and perhaps uh, on the basis of that example, I can show what, what my view of this matter is. The role of Europe in the world or the significance of Europe in the world because in order to play a role, you must have a significance. First of all, as Minister of the Economy, the new power relationship in uh, WTO is something which I actually felt very powerfully. Uh, in fact, we have a w WTO ministerial conference in Davos, uh, which brings together 25 of the most powerful uh, finance ministers of the world uh, to discuss these matters within WTO. Many people uh, uh, had to sit up when the threshold countries worldwide formed their own group. I was a week in, I was a week in Brazil a week ago and I talked to uh, President Lula. President Lula said to me, I want economic power because if I look at USA, Europe, Japan, and a number of industrialized states and put them all together, they represent more than 50% of the world economy. Uh, and I want to see that economic power give way to a demographic power. I would, I would like to, to have the majority of mankind around us and the group of 20, which has now been forged 
includes Brazil, India, China, Indonesia, and on and on. And that does, in fact, represent more than 50% of the world's population. And the discussion is now uh, running along very different lines uh, than uh, the days when there were tensions uh, between Europe and, and America, or Europe and America, or when it was said that uh, Paci the Pacific is the, pa uh, or uh, U.S. Asia was the principal axis. There are other axes, no longer north-south. In, in terms of the of the differential, but these significantly new striving nations. So, uh, t taking the example of the placard of the poster that you saw, uh, uh, I became very concretely aware that uh, we mustn't underestimate the fact that it isn't just a it isn't, it's not just a, a developing country. Uh, a developing doesn't necessarily have to be India, but a developing country can become a new superpower. Well, let me give you a couple of figures just to show you the relationship between Europe uh, and India is 150 times uh, the significance of, of the size of, you've got uh, 7 million Swiss and 150, uh, no, what, whatever it is, a billion Indians. And uh, the, the, there's two and a half, the GDP is incomparably uh, different. And in terms, uh, as so far as business or the economy is concerned, India has achieved takeoff, and it's, it's pretty much assured that it's not going to fall back. It, is, it, is, it, is, it has globally active uh, enterprises. There are 800,000 people, uh, and if with one billion population, India could even achieve even part of the living standards of Europe, you could see that the, there's going to be a major shift in the emphasis. Uh, Europe is bound to lose significantly in importance, in significance. Well, I'd like to bring the other participants into this discussion. You have, you have uh, made things very clear. Now, Professor Garten Ash, if you take uh, Europe and you look at its position in the world map, uh, how do you see, see it, oh, Mr. Dice? Yes, well, I'm here I am on the Magic Mountain. Davos is itself a very fine advertisement, a very fine poster on the question. I'd like to put that into an historical perspective. 200 years ago, Asia had about one half, but more than one half of the world's GDP, the industrial output of the world. The, since then, it declined, and the West uh, emerged and gained, and we've reached a point where the wealth, the wealth uh, lies, and the innovation is in the West, not in the East. But now, what we are witnessing is a renaissance, a rebirth, and it's probably going to be the case that in 30 or 40 years' time, once again, about half of the wealth of the world and the innovation of the world is going to be in Asia and not in Europe and not in the United States. That is the historical perspective. And the question is, what we do about that in Europe, how do we deal with that fact? And now there are two points I would make. First, it's still easier to live in Europe. It's still better living in Europe than anywhere else in the world, just about. It is the unique con combination of peace and freedom, free market economy, but also a measure of social justice and social security. And you won't find that combination anywhere else. Uh, could I just uh, uh, briefly interrupt you? I've heard that too, and it's important for this discussion. In that respect, we certainly are on the defensive. We have to defend this state of affairs. And the second point I would make, and this doesn't perhaps concern Switzerland so much, but what you notice in all the member states of the European Union is a falling away, a decline of the support for the European project. On average, 
only half of the European Union citizens think that the European Union is a good thing. I believe if we can win people back, and particularly the young people, to the European project, then we must find an answer, not for what Europe is doing for itself, but for what Europe can do for the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Let me just summarize. You share the view of Federal Councillor Dice that, in fact, in Asia, that the, uh, the things are really moving forward. In a few decades, one half of the world g GDP is going to be there again. Uh, things are good in Europe, but, uh, we, but the trend is in that direction. Eric Aman, is that also how you see it? Uh, absolutely. I might put it somewhat different, differently. There's Latin America, too. It's not just Asia. Uh, I would want to look at Brazil uh, in the agricultural area because it is it, Brazilia is going to become the powerhouse, already is the powerhouse of the world. Uh, we, there are other Latin American countries, too, that are taking up their international positions in various areas. So I, I think we have to understand that and what Europe has to understand, uh, not just Europe, United States as well. All developed countries have to understand what is going on internationally. and. Uh, Frequently, we we seem we seem to believe that we have to take a negative view, or we have to be defensive, uh, or we have we have to feel that we are shut out from development. I think it's very positive that we can experience this. I think it's very positive that these countries are managing to develop in, into world powers and become uh, co-players. Uh, also, on the political scene, they're also appearing on the political stage. Let's not forget that the majority of the poor population are also to be found in those countries. And that is the secret, the mystery, that on the one hand, we see them taking positions of global power, but on the other hand, they still represent or they still have the largest share of poverty in the world, uh, all those people living on one or two dollars. And so we fi have to find an international uh, response to this. Uh, uh, the countries can't do that by themselves, but everyone has to face that challenge. Now, I spoke about India earlier. India is also the country where, in absolute figures, the largest number of people are who live on less than one dollar a day. Now, perhaps, if we've all agreed on that, perhaps we could try and take one step further. Uh, Mr. Shirtley, what struck me on this placard, on this poster, was was this this idea that India is very self very self uh, confidently proclaiming itself uh, a, a democracy but if you look elsewhere in Asia if you look at China you could say yes China is is um, um, extraordinarily strong in growth but it has a whole heap of disadvantages it's not a democratic country there's no there's no there are no human rights there's no rule of law Nevertheless, there is this weight that has been portrayed. Uh, what would you say about that? Well, let me, let me begin, but, but w I would like to begin by saying that men are overrepresented here in the, on this panel. And it, it, it's a bit embarrassing, too, that it's white people who are always dis discussing what happens to, to whites, white people, red people, slit eyes. My cleaning lady said, uh, so I'm talking about in Beijing. Uh, I'm free on Friday. I, I'm doing my uh, my exam, and uh, I'm doing my driving test. And and if we have all our cleaning ladies taking driving tests, it's going to become really serious with the oil situation. Uh, there was the Austrian uh, Emperor Ferdinand in uh, 19, 18, 1848 uh, saw a revolution breaking out all around. D who, who dares to do this? Who dares to protest? Uh, uh, yes, and nowadays, uh, even the Chinese cleaning, women, cleaning ladies are saying, we, we may drive. We're allowed to drive. Uh, th it means that they can, uh, they, they can afford to do it. So China is becoming the country with $1,000 billion. 
yes, it's true that 200 years ago, India and China, between them, did represent, did account for more than half of the world's GDP, and they're going to get back there again. Uh, they want to learn, and the, the high quality of these human beings, they're not developing countries. I, I reject the use of this term, developing countries, in this, in this uh, context. If, if you look at it in terms of income, it's true. But if you look at the quality of the Indian Institutes of Technology, if you look at the you have to take your hat off to the quality of the people and the quality of what's going on there. The Chinese can pay their way and uh, particularly, and if it's particularly true, if you look at the technical and scientific uh, training that, but on the question of dictatorship, The, 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 the fact that faces us is that China is back on the world stage. I would give them six out of ten for, for economic development. Social development, uh, four or five. Satisfactory. Political development, one. One, absolutely unsatisfactory. And for the first time in the history of mankind, we have a dictatorship uh, which is doing all right. The Soviet Union, well, was a, was a disappointment. So now we have a world power for the first time coming back onto the world stage without being free. We have a nation which was humiliated by the United Kingdom, by Britain, and uh, which uh, exacted a certain uh, reckoning for that. When will the Chinese leadership modernize in political terms uh, and then justifiably join the world community? Well, well I saw uh, Councillor Dice uh, wrinkling his brow when certain things were being said, but well, we shall come back to that. I saw him. Uh, I saw him. His brows gathering in a frown. But I'd like to come to the other panelists and ask them what they have to say and what they've already heard. Well, on the scorecard, we've already seen what you said, and we had, in fact, in the forum, dis we have been discussing. China. Well, you were actually born in Asia, so we do, we, we have an Asian here. <laughs> and the second partner uh, uh, was born and lived 10 years in Japan, learned Japan, a uh, Japanese. You should take the federal councillors seriously. Uh, I would like to say more than two words before being interrupted. At least people haven't started falling asleep. I don't feel too worried about that. Uh, Sentence number two, then. What's the future of Europe? What's Europe's position in the world in the future? But I think for that, we need a little more knowledge about the history. And I think Europe makes the same mistake as Switzerland. Uh, Europe doesn't understand that you can learn strengths from a disaster. Europe in the 20th century was responsible for the largest disasters that ever took place in the world, perhaps in 2,000 years. But in the 40s, at least, Europe learned its political lessons about the future. And the future of Europe will really depend on whether it's able to tap the untapped potential, that is to say, learning from the lessons of the disasters, really 
understand it intellectually and then also to implement the lesson and also to understand that there is a need for the institution of state structures and infrastructure at the transnational level. Human rights, basic rights, have to be guaranteed across borders transnationally because individual states are unable to protect them. To understand the basis of the human rights and the importance of the European Convention of the Human Rights. It's not the European Union that can guarantee that, but rather the Europe of 46 states with all the population and the right that every citizen in Europe has to uh, take the states, his country, her country to court if the human rights are violated. And if Europe was more, was more aware of its strength, then it would have a better future and be able to use its potential. The Council of Europe and the related Human Rights Convention have a potential which is really overshadowed by the European Union. We don't have to fear anyone, not India, not China. We have to see them as partners. But I think we can learn a lot from one another. I think we have to be a little more modest. China has become the factory of the world. Don't forget that revolutions have always come from the factories when the workers were badly treated. That's what we have to be careful about and pay attention to. Federal Councillor Dice has asked for the floor. Well, I first spoke as the Minister of the Economy, but obviously I'm not only wearing that hat. When we talk about the importance and significance, I'm glad that Andy Gross picked that up. It's not only a question of economic power. What is the importance or significance of Europe as a leader in other areas, in the cultural area, or in the political sense or meaning of the term uh, democracy? I wasn't wrinkling my brow because of the mention of the Polytechnic, the Swiss Federal Polytechnical University. I, I didn't quite understand that Mr. Shetley was getting so upset without any cause. We all know that China and India are very ancient cultures with ancient traditions and that they're not only going to, just not going to disappear from one day to the next. I really was wondering why you were getting so excited about something that we all uh, accept and I think it's completely natural. Andy Gross said something that I would like to correct. He said that China is the factory of the world. I don't think it's just a question of manufacturing of uh, manual labor. Some people think that only cheap products come from China or are being outsourced and dis relocated from Europe and the United States to China. I said 800,000 Indians today worldwide are in leading positions in inf information technology. A week ago, I was in Bangalore and I didn't uh, inaugurate a factory there, but a research center of the ABB, which produces so software there for its products. So uh, the production of those countries is not just in, in cheap labor products. Well, that's why I picked up this uh, question of the Swiss Polytechnical University or Institute. We have uh, spoken about the achievements of Europe and human rights and the Human Rights Convention, but Mr. Shetley, you have written articles about things that have not yet been achieved in China. And of course, we can always say it would be wonderful if they were achieved and it's important, but perhaps we should rethink our own situation. It's not good to fall into Euro pessimism. And I must uh, say to our Germans that the, uh, there's no sorrier uh, nation than the Germans. The German-French reconciliation is of historic importance. And you really realize that when you're in Southeast Asia, there's not only tension between Japan and China, but the situation is deteriorating. The history books are being rewritten, not to the better, but 
for the worse. So there are major challenges that have to be met. Look at the Korean Peninsula. There may be explosion there any time. So peace is something that should not be underestimated, especially not when you're a European. Of course, China has all sorts of failings when it comes to human rights and constitutionality. But look at the situation as it was in China when Mao died in 1976. Well, the Chinese have actually managed to fight against poverty, and that was a wonderful achievement. 25 million people were raised from the threshold of poverty to better well-being. Another important point that was mentioned was that we should be more modest. I recently had a conversation with one of the most important Chinese professors, Wang Hoi, who has written uh, 11 tome history of China's development. One million ideograms. And he told me something I have not forgotten. He said, you expect us Asians, the Indians, the Chinese, the Japanese, that we know who Napoleon was, Goethe was, the French Revolution, Mozart, and what can we expect from you? What kind of knowledge can we expect from you, the Europeans? What on earth do you learn about our history? I learned all the battles of the Romans, and I, I, I know exactly which god, Greek god, is related to which goddess, but what do you know about the, the Meiji Restoration or the 19th century history of India and China. I bet a bottle of champagne that no one knows here what the Meiji Restoration is. And without that, you cannot understand contemporary Japan. So we too should be a bit more modest and uh, include learning about Asia in our curricula. Yes, but modesty also goes the other, the other way. We should have more modest claims in Europe. We live in, uh, we are used to claims, and Asia has quite a different situation. In any case, the title of this mm, panel discussion is The Future of Europe in the World, and that's what I would like to discuss about. If we want to change our attitude, then we have to expect a colder wind to blow. What does that mean if we want to keep up with everyone else in the world? Yes, I think you are quite right, and we can already feel it. All countries can feel this to differing extents. Some are better off than others. If we look at the European Union, for example, if you look at the Nordic countries, they simply are differently placed. You take Germany and France, Spain, Portugal, everyone is feeling the wind of change. We have to understand two things probably haven't realized this sufficiently in the past. First of all, we have to reposition ourselves and in the world. And that's always something that the EU finds very difficult. We may be good in economic terms, but we're we are absolutely uh, incredibly bad at foreign relations. How do you want to have a geo strategic or geopolitical evaluation of your own position when you don't have this foreign affairs dimension, when it isn't being seen as such import as of such importance, it may be perceived by some statesmen, but only in terms of controversy between certain heads of state of European countries. If you take the discussion about Turkey. No one really knows what the formal position will be of the great of Great Britain. Will it be Tony Blair's position or Gordon Brown's? We know what Chirac thinks. May I interrupt you? It's a bit theoretical. No, it's not theoretical. It's very, very practical. It's real. It's really related to reality and to to the practice. Well, I I don't think it's uh, concrete enough. You are a woman, a socialist. Uh, the you come from the Schroeder government. You have working hours which have nothing to do with the working hours in China. We will probably have to work longer hours and probably earn less. Are we willing to accept this? I th I'm sure we can discuss economic questions and political questions, but we have to be very specific. Mr. Shutley. No, I don't think that we should reduce our uh, 
uh, conditions to bring them to the level of Chinese, working conditions and pay conditions, but I'm convinced of the following. 200 years ago, Asia went poor and we, Europe became rich. And we have to now prevent that the opposite happens. And we have wonderful opportunities. The Federal Council dies. You were in Beijing not so long ago. You go to a store, Wan Chu Fing Ling, the, the shopping lane, every second store sells Swiss watches. The young Chinese want to buy a swatch, and they want a swatch that is made in Switzerland and not copied in China, which is mostly the case. And you really defended this position very, very well by, well, may I interrupt you and tell you an anecdote? It's true, I was in Beijing, and I had this official meeting with the Minister of the Economy, Ho Chi Lai. We had uh, some time left before we had to go to this official encounter, and I asked him, what would you like to do? And I told him that I was years ago at Tiananmen Square, and I would have liked to see it again. So we set off, and it didn't take two minutes before a roving uh, uh, seller wanted to sell me a Rolex. And I wondered whether I should buy one, but I thought it would not be a good thing if I was being photographed by a, by a photographer or if there were any journalists lurking in the area. I told the minister that for us a problem is these copies, these counterfeits. And he said, it's not possible. Swiss watches are so, so complicated. We cannot copy them. A Louis Vuitton bag or something like that, that's easier to copy. And I said, S what a pity, what a pity that you didn't accompany me on my walk to the Tiananmen Square. You would have seen yourself that there are copies of Swiss watches in China. In China, we now have 260 million people who count amongst the middle classes. So there is a growing middle class in India and China. Once you have met the basic needs, everyone wants to go for brand branded products. It's apparently the case that in 2010, 60 million Chinese will be able to travel abroad. That's wonderful divorce. That means that the hotels will be booked out for the next 20 years or more. And if they're well treated, then obviously they will, will come. They love traveling and they love spending money and they will buy the genuine Rolex watch when they get to Davos. Yes, I, I, I accept that, Mr. Shirtley. Maybe we don't have to go down to this simple level of working hours. We've only spoken about Asia. We only have another 15 minutes up here, and then we'll have to hand the discussion to the floor. Perhaps we should also speak about the relationship between Europe and the United States, but I'm quite willing to have an open discussion. Let me just mention one more thing. I was very impressed by a full-page article you had in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung and where you wrote very clearly that the most important issues are the way values are still still prevail and that the, 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 the respo feeling of responsibility and duty is still very pronounced in China. Let me just say something. I spoke to high school students in Solitaire not so long ago. And when I spoke to them, I said, first of all, you should congratulate and thank the parents, then the teachers, and then the canton of Solitaire. And then you, the high school graduates, should you be thanked and congratulated? No, it was your duty to your parents, your teachers, and the canton of Solitaire to show that you uh, that you that you were meet, you know up to, to to doing what you were supposed to do, and that is also something that you could say the kind of speech you could m make in China. A meeting. Well, you, you shouldn't mention the the Meiji this question of the Meiji Restoration because you're pointing really to a uh, cultural crisis in Europe. On the 4th and 5th of January, 
uh, you introduce these three examples. Who in Switzerland knows this, that, or the other? The the the, the uh, there is a, a pearl diving culture, a pearl diving website in Germany. They always take the best uh, articles from Europe, and then you and your three questions. You gave the website where you could find the answer. So uh, about millions of Europeans uh, will be able, if you ask them that, will be able to answer it. So let's stick to the main issue, says the moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have something to say? If not, maybe I should uh, give the floor to uh, Timothy Garten Ash. Uh, I'd just like to pick up one point. We're seeing something unique in China, which is Leninist capitalism, a linking of capitalism and a dominant, a ruling communist party. And we've never seen that anywhere before. Mostly where capitalism came, there, there came with it better respect for human rights and in the final analysis, some sort of democracy. And how should we behave in regard to this? That's the question. And um, we're behaving, we're, we're relating very poorly, damn badly, in fact. Instead of uh, asserting our own uh, uh, principles and values in the world, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China or other countries, we are falling over each other to kowtow to them. Uh, we are competing with France in uh, selling our goods, but we're saying absolutely nothing about uh, human rights. And then here comes Chirac and says even less about human rights and makes even more offers. And this is a, this is a disgrace. It really is a disgrace for Europe. And if y Europe wishes to be something or become something in the world, then we have to assert our own values calmly but resolutely it, it, when we are dealing with China and Asia. We must represent our values in Asia. That's well, that turns us I I to the question, uh, what should Europe do? You've mentioned one thing, and we could talk for 10 minutes about that. What should Europe, what must Europe do in order to play a role in the future? It must realize at home what, I what it might do what it would like to do in the world in future, because Europe too is, is divided, is split. It's not just privileged EU plus Switzerland, Norway, etc. We have to also realize that this Europe, our Europe, is uh, split. We have the new countries. We, Germany already exports more to the so-called new countries of the EU than it does to the United States. So there's, a, there's some catching up to do even within the EU. And it's even worse if we look at the the, the, the differential between the 25 EU countries and the 46 minus two, the 43 uh, minus 25, in other words, 16, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova uh, included, where the living standards are a disaster, but also the awareness of the necessity of human rights. Uh, there is... It's nothing to do with 44 hours or 35 hour week. Human rights is a claim, a demand that is made on ourselves, that it is a value which we ourselves in the future will have to claim for ourselves. We're not going to retreat from them because that was the lesson learned from the great disasters, which 300 years long, every 30 years, there was a war in Alsace. Uh, you, don't have to tell, you don't have to tell me that. Uh, no, no, you misunderstand me. If you just, if, if you simply watch the media, watch television, listen to the radio, read the papers, you'll say, you'll realize that, uh, that the, the same thing was said about human rights. The great question is, those who claim uh, a market monopoly, how are they, what are they going to do when they have to, 
when they have to share the market. Um, Uh, 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 that's the big question I'd like to uh, ask, which I think our panelists need to address. Well, I have to, to say two things, first of all. And of course, I agree with you. Uh, it annoys me when I hear you say that we have to bring our values to the Chinese. Ladies and gentlemen, 2,000 years before William Tell, Mencius, the Confucian philosopher, not only asserted the right, but the duty Is, is the human being good or bad? We had Hobbes and Locke uh, uh, discussing this matter. Uh, yeah, the Chinese Republic was founded in 1911. Sun Yat-sen uh, wanted to introduce referendums and uh, uh, people's initiatives. So that's the first thing. Uh, and we can achieve far more if, in our debate with them, if we offer them help in the transition process. What, what is the issue? The, my own experience in China is that the, the, the Chinese is not, is not just a blue ant, he's, he's an anarchist. We've got all those huge numbers of potential anarchists. Let me give you an example from the province Shandong. They made know that they had difficulties in recruiting police. A policeman is the most dangerous profession today, the most dangerous occupation. They get beaten up, they get uh, assaulted, they get murdered, because the anger against authority uh, is focused on the policeman. And we, have, we, we, we know from the statistics, 70,000, there were 7,000 revolts, and revolt is when more than hundred people turn against the police. That's how they define a revolt in China. So those are the, those are the statistics of the Communist Party. So, and uh, that's, that's what they face if they, if they, if they are if serious about modernizing uh, the leadership, that is. 20 billion US dollars go missing every year. Honest reformers in China face the following problem. They, they know they have to get from uh, A, dictatorship, to point B, rule of law, civilization, and then on to C, democracy. They know they have to progress from A to B to C, and they are afraid that on the way there's going to be a head-to-head, -to -head and, and they, they, they are very admiring of what takes place, what is taking place in India for all the difficulties. Uh, Whoever gets the majority, whichever party gets the majority in parliament, be, um, becomes president. Well, let me try to summarize. Europe, uh, Europe's future lies in the defense of its uh, values and, uh, uh, and influencing the transformation process in China, but not via the United States. There's been threefold mention of the United States. Uh, if you don't want to talk about that particular relationship, that's okay as well. As, uh, I, I think you, as a good journalist, you, you misquoted me. Well, it was nuanced. It was nuanced, uh, not a misquotation. I didn't say we have to assert our values, that we have to take our values to the Chinese or export them for practical purposes, rather the way the Americans are trying to do in Iraq. What I said is we must represent our values, and that means something else. That, that is something different. It, and they're not exclusively our values. Many of these values are, in fact, universal. And you find many of them in Confucius. But if we don't represent our own values, then that is a scandal and a disgrace. Uh, for, for to, in order to, uh, to make our moderator happy and uh, to start talking about America, let me say the following. Uh, my, I've, been, I've, been traveled, I've traveled in the past year to practically all European countries with my, with my new book. And I see, if you ask what all Europeans know about the world outside of Europe, 
They know something about Europe, but outside of Europe, what do Europeans know about Japan, about China, about Africa, about Latin America? Almost nothing, almost nothing. The only thing that all Europeans have in common is America. They all recognize America, or recognize themselves in America. They know the smallest details of the, what's going on in Washington politics. They can name the neocons uh, of the third rank. It is really rather embarrassing, isn't it, that the only thing that all Europeans really have in common is America. Even our anti-Americanism is something we have in common. Because we all read the Americans, we, we see American films, and they're, they're, they are also criticizing America. So my what I'm urging is that we should be less concerned with ourselves here and much less with America, far less. We, everybody lives from America, but we don't. We should concern ourselves more with the world, with our own analysis of the world outside of Europe and with the question as to what we want, we Europeans want to do there. Well, the, Europe the Canadians are the Europeans of North America, if you like. They're the biggest alliance partner, and Brazilians too. What they hope is that together with Europe, they, they can manage to do in the world what the Europeans have already managed to do for themselves. And the, the UN is the expression of the day before yesterday, the national state organization of the world from the day before yesterday. There are people who are saying what is ending now is the, peace, is the, is the time of the peace of Westphalia. Uh, and the critical category there was the, was the organization of, uh, of humanity. And uh, Europe made itself the biggest uh, disaster. But the which I've also seen in discussions at the Catholic University, that what the Brazilians, they hope far for far more from Europe as an alliance partner than they do from the United States. It's a, it is a question of common values, but it is also a, 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 of, it's, a, it's also how you get to the goal um, and differential efforts. They have to represent to them things they don't want to hear. And I would also would want to do that vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese. We have a f then we'd have a far better basis for discussion with the Chinese. We know what the common basis is. And it will also show with in our dealings with the Chinese that we have a better basis. Thank you very much. Now I would propose that we hear uh, Herr Dyson and Frau Mann, and then we bring the audience in. First of all, from you. Frau Mann, I completely agree that we need to think more about our Europe policy and be far more realistic in our perception of the United States, but that doesn't mean that we form alliances, or whether we're with Brazil or any other country of the world. I don't think that's what it means. I think what it means, first of all, is that we determine our position, who we are actually, and what position we wish to take up in this world, uh, and that we require more flexible alliances. I'm a transatlantic person, and I think uh, I, I th we must be realistic in our own perceptions, because if we don't do that, then we shall always be looking at ourselves in the mirror. We should be looking always at the, to the United States, which is completely absurd. And if... And... Uh, if we don't take on the other countries in their inherent relevance and importance, then we will be making a mistake. We reacted far too late vis-a-vis uh, -vis China when the discussion of the China embargo came up. Uh, we reacted hectically. Some countries wanted it, and then there was protests, protests, and then we pulled back a step. Similar thing with Russia. Some countries would like to have uh, business alliances. Uh, they go there, they engage in cooperation. That's not, that's not all, that's not, that's not wrong. But to have strategies to be more present, 
that means that you ha you have to find your own position and your own p position in the world. Well, I'd like to hear Herr Dice uh, to tell us a bit w what he makes of the whole discussion that we've had so far, and then we'll turn our attention to the audience. For there. Thank you. Before the discussion started, Mr. Brenwald, Brenwald uh, told me that you have to just wait your turn, like at the ARENA program, and if you are patient enough, you will get the floor again. Anyway, let me go to a point that was raised earlier on. As an economist, I've always maintained that for an economy to function and be successful, you need certain things, the rule of law, democracy, and the market. And I've always assumed that you cannot do without these three factors or elements. But China is indeed a question mark in this respect, because you cannot really talk about China as being a democracy you said there wasn't even rule of law or order, Mr. Gartner. There is some economic certainty because otherwise no one would invest there, so there must be a bit of rule of law nonetheless. And the market seems to be allowed to function quite well. But the proof of the pudding is in su sustainability for me any, in any case. We have to see what will happen in the long term if such prosperity can actually last. But what bothers me, bothers me is this proselytism, this missionary attitude that uh, Europeans seem to have inherent in them, including the Swiss. We've, we're being asked what's, what Europe should be doing. Well, we should defend our values, is being said. It's to go forth in the whole world and teach the world what true democ democracy is, how to manage and observe and respect human rights properly. I had some very nice experiences in a country when I was on a visit there as a foreign affairs minister and I was asked about human rights. And my opposite number then said to me, since when? Are women allowed to vote in Switzerland, by the way? And he added that they had it since 50 or 60 years. And I told him, well, since 1971. He said, no, 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 there's a canton where women didn't have the right until the 90s. So for us, it seems to be quite obvious that everything is perfect and in order. We cannot assume this any longer. We cannot go out, go forth, and be uh, missionaries and try and stuff democracy down other countries' throats. I'm always looking for partnership and cooperation. Europe does have an opportunity in the future. It does have opportunities in the future if it is willing to cooperate with other countries. That's what one does in the economy anyway. We look for partners. And I think that also applies to other sectors, not just the economy. You said earlier on, Andy Gross, that we should be a little more modest. And I think here, too, we should be a little more modest. Very well. Thank you very much. I'm very glad now to pass the floor to the audience. Maybe the questions will set off in quite different directions. The microphones will be coming to you. Just raise your hand or stand up and let us know if you want to put a question and also introduce yourselves. Here there are some raised hands. So far, we haven't said anything about the financial imbalances and inequalities uh, that exist between Europe, Asia, and the United States. Is that not a, uh, an issue? Doesn't that make the whole situation even more fractious? 
shouldn't there be even more rapid reactions about this financial imbalance, or can we just let things run without any intervention? Well, can you be a little more, be a bit more specific? Well, China and other Asian economies are accumulating their surpluses in the trade balance, and the United States has a m tremendous I deficit, and Europe has European, certain UK, European economies are suffering from a deficit in their trade balance. So what is the interaction between this issue and what we have discussed so far? Do you want to put this question to Mr. Dyson? He's the Minister of the Economy of Switzerland. Yes, I'm happy to answer. When you do have a trade deficit, that means that you're making debts. As you say, you have a partner, an economic partner, a trade partner who's willing to be your creditor. What does that mean in specific terms? It means that the Americans are able to make this deficit on condition that others are not going to claim payment of this debt, that they are willing to be the creditors of the United States. The dollars that the Chinese are accumulating are rights that the Chinese hold to purchase parts of the American economy. But for as long as they keep these dollars in the bank on their accounts, they have trust in the American currency. And for as long as this trust and confidence is maintained, nothing will happen. So it really depends on whether the Americans are able to maintain their economic activity at the present level. If that is so, we will allow the Americans to continue to live by making debts. Mr. Schuster, could you be very brief? You wanted the floor. If we want to have any self-confidence as Europeans, we have to tell the Chinese that they were able to develop so rapidly economi economically because we accepted them. If Europe had been more protectionist, Europe would not be where it is today. Everything is due and owing to the export uh, activity. You will play an important role this year, Mr. Federal Councillor, and that is in respect of the undervaluation of the Chinese currency. The value of the currency should be measured by the internal purchasing power. We now have six went to one Swiss franc, but in fact it should be about a proportion of one to two. Many jobs in the United States and in Europe are being destroyed because of this uh, undervaluation of the Chinese currency, and this is where we have to defend ourselves. We, not aggressively so, but we have to tell the Chinese that they are an economic power in the world. You are benefiting from everything, but you also have duties, for example, protection of industrial property rights, intellectual property rights, and uh, oh, more transparency. There is no transparency in China. The, the Shanghai uh, Stock Exchange is right up floor, uh, on the floor, it is really low, whereas the Chinese economy is booming. So what kind of relationship is that? So that is where Europe has to a role to play as well. Councillor Dice. No, that's not the full picture. If the Chinese were to reduce their dollars, they would have to buy back Chinese current, the Chinese currency, and then the Chinese currency would probably rise in value again, but it would also lead to a weaker dollar, and that would not really help Switzerland in particular. I'd say that the situation isn't as terrible as that, nor that uh, the situation is leading to a destruction of jobs here. It's also in our interest that our uh, companies have access to foreign markets, and that means that there is a counterpart as well. If you want to sign contracts, then you have to have access to the market. We have a relocation of jobs and activities in India and China, but we've also increased a lot our exports to China and India. In one year, they increased by 40%. Our exports to India last year and the year before 
in grows by 35% every year. That means jobs in Switzerland, which otherwise would not exist, or not to such, ex such an extent, if we didn't have companies that uh, gained market shares in those countries. Who else would like to put a floor? Uh, a question, I beg your pardon. Please raise your hand. I was very surprised by what was said. You've spoken about European values, democracy, But these are just empty words. It's like a bottle of Coca-Cola. There's not always Coca-Cola in such a bottle that has the name of Coca-Cola on it. We're in, in a, we are multicultural in Europe. We are in a postmodern world. So how would you define these values then? If we don't de define them, I don't think we can bring about change. You have to argue it to the end of what can be argued. We may have a world of religion uh, if we also take into account this Declaration 17. Herr Gartner, Herr Sie Professor das, Gartner ich, Ash. To whom was this question addressed? Uh, Mr. Garten Ash? Well, let me tell you what I think. I think it's always very dangerous if you try to link certain values to a certain geographic area or region. It's very dangerous to talk about American or British or European values or Western values. This seems to imply or make the claim or may be understood that these values only belong to us, that they're exclusive. That's why I agree entirely with you, maybe not in the way you expressed it or in your overall uh, evaluation. I do agree with what you said at the beginning. We must be a little more concrete. We have to say exactly what we mean when we talk about human dignity or human rights or democracy. We really have to define very clearly what we mean by that. Ma Mrs. Mann, you want to say something? I think we could be a little more pragmatic when we talk about human rights at the WTO, then there are standards that are very simple and clearly defined. They are not necessarily European or American values or human rights. They, are, they have been defined at the international level. And things like the prohibition of child labor, uh, the right to, of, to assembly and trade union rights, these things have been defined. And I think that is what is the crux. It's not a question of having a very complicated philosophical infrastructure or structure. We want these simple values that are observed and maintained and defended. A question from the back of the hall. I'd like to bring in another geographical region which has not been mentioned yet. and a region which has become very much, which has come very much to the forefront of the international attention, that's the Near East, the Middle East. Now, Europe has been criticized gently, and regarding the Middle East, Europe has not paid all its debts yet. Could you be a bit more specific, asked the moderator? There's the Holocaust. That's one thing. The British then gave the Jews a land, a country which did not belong to the British. All this is at the root and the cause of the current situation. Could you put your question, asked the moderator? Well, my question then is, and I'd like to put it to the National Council of Gross. What possibilities does he see? What possibilities 
does Europe have to defuse this bomb for certain reasons, political reasons? The United States cannot do this. Well, it just goes to show I get the most complicated question to, answers, to answer. I hope that the professor from Oxford will be able to say something about what the British did or should do. I do agree with you that Europe has a responsibility. And I also agree with you about the fact that land and a country were given that did not, were not theirs to give and that there are problems that are still outstanding since 1947. The US policy in the Middle East is very closely connected to the domestic politics and policies of the United States. But I don't know whether Europe can do something all on its own. For that, we need the cooperation with the United States, but also that with Russia which is part of this triumvirate. And I think here we have a major achievement of the European Union because it does have a policy there, and it's a good policy. If you don't like the result, then, well, that's just too bad. One seems to pretend that Hitler came to power democratically, but that's not true. That is a totally wrong analysis because he never got the majority. Now a party that not was a terrorist group and not so long ago has now won an election with a majority and has changed in a way that was unthinkable not so long ago. And I'd say the same things regarding Hamas that I voiced earlier on regarding the Chinese. But Europe cannot possibly do anything without the Russians or the Americans regarding the Middle East. The new prime minister in Israel said quite correctly that we have to work together. And I think the Palestinians have understood this now. Only they have not uh, elected those who were just a corrupted lot of people. And in Canada, the liberals were not elected, even though they had a wonderful foreign policy but were were cheating at home. That's what has happened to Fatah in the Middle East and the liberals in Canada. But it, it doesn't mean that the majority is speaking out in favor of terrorism. So you have to be very careful about how you analyze things and interpret things when you're a European. May I bring you back to the topic of the discussion? Does Europe have a future? Are we lagging behind? Are we in the caboose? What is our position? How should we position ourselves regarding the future? Another question here in the front of the hall. Oh, Entschuldigung, das war ein Missverständnis. Well, that was a misunderstanding. We'll do that later. First, the gentleman who has the microphone, and then after that, you will have it. My question is addressed to Mr. Dice. It's as if we were the owners of democracy, we Europeans. Here at the World Economic Forum, we must say that we have an economic system that isn't democratic at all. That's basic criticism that has been voiced again and again in the past, that the World Economic Forum is not a democratic institution. Would you like to say something about uh, uh, um, Councillor Dice? I hear it again and again from people who don't want to come to Davos because they feel it is uh, indecent for 
for people to come to a closed meeting and to agree on things that are not really democratic. Well, I don't think that it was the World Economic Forum that was being criticized. It was the gentleman saying that the economic system is not democratic, not the World Economic Forum. That's how I understood the gentleman. I don't think I don't think we should criticize the forum if if that is not what is being meant by the question that was put by the participant. Well, what is a fair and just system, and what is an efficient system when you're talking about an economic system? The economists say that that markets are much more democratic than majority systems because on the market, every individual can decide what he or she wants or what he or she wants to refuse. If you're in a majority system, you have to follow and rally to the majority even if you're part of the minority. If you want to drink Coca-Cola, if you don't want to drink Coca-Cola, well, it still is there on the market. The system can only be democratic if everyone has one vote. In our democratic systems, it's true that every citizen has one vote on the market, of course, the forces are distributed more unequally because some have more strength, more power than others. And that is why we have to find an order, a system that is not only efficient, but also maintains a certain equality and fairness in distribution. Market economy is very similar to democracy. No one seems to have found a better system than the market economy at least not in recent in the recent past, if you study the recent history. I agree it's not necessarily the best system or a democratic system, but the market economy is still probably the better best system compared with all others. And now the gentleman in the corner here in the front. Mr. Strickelberger, Swiss Evangel uh, Federation of Evangel Evangelical Churches. There's a dimension that I'd like to pick up here. Uh, and emphasize it even more, the question that uh, Europe of the religions. I'm convinced that the economic development, the political development cannot be separated from the issue as to how do religions deal with each other and what can Europe contribute to this? It being, uh, having had a, suc uh, being successful in, in dealing with religions. It is pluralist, it is fair, uh, and can play a role in that regard. Uh, our Federation of Swiss Evangelical Churches has th uh, three times had a uh, seminar uh, also where the officials uh, concerned with religion from China uh, to address the question of uh, the treatment of religion in Europe. And, how, and they wanted to know how we deal with this in Switzerland, how do we do it peacefully? And that's an example of, of a contribution we could make. Couldn't Europe play a more active role it, when we if we succeed uh, among the monotheistic and the non-monotheistic religions, we manage to have a peaceful coexistence among them. Isn't that something which we could uh, contribute? Well, I think Mr. Shirtley wanted to say something. As somebody who belongs uh, to Shinto, uh, I know something about Shintoism. The Asian religions never w make war with one another. It's only when you get the monotheistic religions that they start uh, making war on each other. In Japan, in Japan, they've got two religions, for example, China and Japan. I'm talking about religion now. For example, in Japan, there's Shintoism, which they do baptisms, they do marriages, and then Buddhism deals with uh, with death. In Ch China, people can be Taoists. Confucius is, in any case, not a, not a religion. He was a teacher of wisdom, very pragmatic. And the way the Chinese deal with religion is also very pragmatic. I don't think you can't. 
urge the Chinese on to kill each other in the name of a religion. I think the Europeans should, should rather learn lessons from Asian religions and the way they deal with it. If you look at the way religions deal with the environment, Shintoism has always been very conscious of the environment. And I think we monotheistic religions could learn something from them. Professor Carton Ash. I also think it, that if we were all Buddhists, we would probably have a more peaceful world. But we are not. And because what Mr. Shirtley has just said is true, that is in a challenge to Europe, because here, in our uh, area, in our region, or in the, uh, or in the uh, Near East, in the Middle East, we find the three great monotheistic religions uh, confronting one another, clashing with one another. Uh, by contrast with the situation in Asia, and the major challenge for Europe is not in what it deal, how it deals with Judaism or Christianity. It is how it deals with Islam. To be European for centuries meant not to be Muslim. That was the way Pius II, the Pope Pius II, defined Europe back in the 15th century, the non-Islamic world. So Islamic Europeans would be a contradiction in terms for him, as if you said uh, a, a, ma uh, a female man or a male woman. This would be an inherent contradiction, no doubt with some exceptions. But and today, the issue precisely here in Europe, where there are 20 million Muslims, and Turkey is at the door waiting outside. It's our task to demonstrate that it is possible to be Islamic Europeans. And that would be a great model, a great example, not just for Europe, but for the dialogue between the 2.3 billion Christians in our world and the 1.3 billion Muslims. Thank you very much. Any further questions from the audience? Please stick your hand up, and the microphone will come to you. They're over there on the left, and then behind. I have a question to put to Herr Shirtley. You uh, took a side digression into, uh, into teaching and to pedagogic. How do you want to restore a situation where these values that you mentioned, uh, that, that these, these values are reaffirmed in our educational system, that's to say performance and a certain respect for teachers, uh, parents, and so on. Well, in Switzerland, I go to dozens of schools, high schools and so forth, and I'm enthusiastic about the young people who are growing up here. They are all very performance oriented they're all they're all willing to perform to try uh, and people are made uncertain they want to travel to asia for example and also in germany you should you should take 2 years off after you finish your studies and go to asia is what i recommend to the students they used to go to South America. That's certainly very important. But I make, I would say, I'll give you, give you a prediction. I would say about 50% of the of the of people of uh, of people who are in work have something to do with Asia. Not that they've traveled to Asia, but they they have some kind of connection. So I'm optimistic for that reason. But what what do you mean by values? What does that mean? I think once again there, there has to be an exemplary function has to some f function as a, a set by setting an example. So, so it's not, it isn't, isn't dependent on the sex appeal of some actress, but rather that, but setting an example of civil courage, for example. Well, 
Can we bring the discussion back to Europe and Asia? Because I read uh, an interview with Fred Kindley, uh, the ABB CEO, and he said that uh, if you fly into Beijing, if if you if you go to an airport in Europe, you see I want fun. If you go to Beijing, you see work hard. This is a this is a contrast of values. Well, th this is all too uh, across the board, to, to, to lump sum judgments. There's nothing more chaotic than India. If you take India as an example, they have a lot of fun. There's a lot a lot of fun there. And if you arrive at the airport there, it's chaotic. Even so, you have this enclave, this island, which uh, which functions perfectly well. So you can't you can't have these lump these these gross generalizations. That some are good, some are bad, some are perfect. And I don't have any problem with that. Next question. Are you okay? Frau Mann, ich hab I have a question to put to uh, Mrs. Mann. You have told us that Europe needs to develop strategies. In Davos, we can look to north, south, west, and east, and everywhere all I see government systems which are, which are all pointing in different directions. How do you want to find a strategy which, for which there is a common denominator? Well, I don't think we need a one denominator. I don't believe that uh, we, uh, we, we, we we're going to get a Europe which is no longer where there's no longer any dispute. Uh, there has to be argument over what foreign policy is, uh, 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 but that's not what we're doing. When it comes to strategies or geopolitical notions, we renationalize politics. Or when it comes to that. We don't, on the European level, have any proper discussion about these differences in conception or differences in view. You can argue about whether we need that, but we don't have any proper, any proper European foreign policy. We've only gotten the beginnings of it. What we need, we do need to argue about this, and we shouldn't renationalize foreign policy. If there's a problem with Turkey, for example, or with, uh, with French politicians have a problem, it's not just a French problem. It's a German problem, too. It's a problem for Switzerland. It's a problem in Norway. It's a problem everywhere in Europe. And it's not just the European Union. And we're not having that dispute. We're not having that argument. Uh, we immediately take a step backwards. And I think that's, that's bad. We saw that with the energy policy of Russia. You can all name examples, but you see it, it it is a nationally dominated policy. And then when we face a crisis which uh, concerns all of us, all of a sudden we start saying we need a European strategy. Why didn't we think about that sooner? When, when it's noticed that there one nation t takes up a, a one-sided position, then the others need to intervene. Andreas Gross wants it, wanted to take the floor too. Then we have to come to a close. I just want to build another bridge. Frau Mann was implying or meant to say, well, the answer was too abstract, I think, for, the, for, for these, these, these close results, the 41, the 51. We're talking about national identity in uh, foreign policy, which, have, which has grown up over 100 years. It, so it doesn't matter who is president in France. There's, there's a very specific understanding or, or agreement on French foreign policy. Um, that's why we don't talk so much about that. Uh, what we're asking for, of the Chinese, we ought to be doing ourselves. And that's why in 1990, Europe blew up uh, in Yugoslavia uh, with the Germans and the Austrians supporting the Croats and, and uh, the others supporting the Serbs. We need to develop a common strategy, but we should, f we, should, we should begin by looking back over our own history and being honest about it. We should finally, we should have a decent discussion about these things in our past. Well, 
thank you very much. That was uh, somewhat reminiscent of the program Arena. Uh, oh, now you're all sticking your hands up. Uh, well, we'll have one more question, and then we really have to close. Uh, it wasn't working before, I think. I'm an engineer from Germany. Or uh, Europe's future, a uh, powerful challenge, and I'd like to say something about that. We've, got, we've been through two world wars, which uh, started on German soil. And today, we could be in a similar position. And I'm very grateful for what you said, Mr. Shirtley, about uh, the sober evaluation of the Chinese. And I would say uh, that my question is, how believe, how can anyone believe that nations, w nations with so much baggage that they haven't come to terms with yet, uh, just to take the example of the treatment of Christians in China, how can Europe believe that it has a future if it seeks to do business in so many uh, places where there is murder and death going on, and this is true in China today still. How can you believe that we in the Western world, where we have millions of abortions, and we talk about human rights? It's impossible that you could believe that we can continue to enjoy peace one thing is certain, we are not God. The Creator requires us to honor and to revere Him. And that's something which we've forgotten in Europe. How can you believe that you there could be a good future for the people here or anywhere with this burden, this ancient burden of guilt, uh, which is broadly distributed among the European peoples? I don't know who should answer this question because this is a question which would take us very far, and we are, we are now coming to the, de, to the closure, a close of this discussion. It's a, it's a good question. It's one that we could reflect on perhaps on, after we've gone home. W well, we need open economic relations with all countries. That, uh, and if you decided that, that was not possible, then you're starting to talk about embargoes but we're in favor of opening up societies. And you can't simply say, we're not going to do a business with China or any other country. Well, as I said, you can go on discussing this. Uh, you can, but you, you can go on discussing in uh, an official space. Um, there is a post discussion in the Cafe Chocolino uh, later this evening for an hour. Uh, and you can take part in that. The Swiss uh, Federation of Eve Evangelical Churches is organizing that. And if you want to meet there immediately after this, you'll, uh, you'll find the details outside in the lobby. Please leave your headsets on your seats. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a pleasant evening. <laughs>